Hello and welcome to today's lecture on horn antenna. In fact, in the last few lectures, we have been talking about horn antenna. So, we started with the rectangular waveguide and we saw that if the rectangular waveguide is like this, then E field is perpendicular going like this and the E field goes from the maxima at the center and it goes towards 0. So, in fact, uh, this plane here is H plane and this plane here is E plane. So, if we expand the whole thing in E plane, it is known as E plane sectoral horn and if we expand in this particular direction, then it is H plane sectoral horn antenna. And then we talked about pyramidal horn antenna in which what actually happens that we expand in this direction as well as in this direction. So, let us continue from there. So, we had seen that this is a pyramidal horn antenna and that was the side view and the top view. And then from here, we had also seen that the amplitude variation will be given by this cosine function, where if x dash is equal to 0, which is at the center, field will be maximum. And at the edge, x dash will be a 1 by 2. So, that will be cos pi by 2 will be equal to 0. And in the terms of phase, the phase terms will be actually summation of both the phase terms in the E plane as well as in the H plane. So, the phase error will be much larger and condition for physical realization actually there is only one and that is rho E should be equal to rho H and the values of rho E and rho H can be obtained from the pyramidal dimension. And then we had actually seen that the gain of the pyramidal horn antenna which has been taken as this particular term which is a 4 pi area divided by lambda square that is a normal directivity expression and area is here aperture area which is equal to a 1 times b 1. Efficiency has been taken equal to 0 0.5 and I want to mention that we will just look into the design given in this particular book of Balanus, but however, we will tell you what things can be done so that we can improve the efficiency to even 70 percent or 80 percent. So, now we will continue from here. So, we had seen that for optimum horn antenna dimension A 1 is given by this expression, B 1 is given by this expression which was approximated to this particular expression. This expression is only good if the aperture dimensions A 1 and B 1 are relatively small. Only in that case this approximation is valid. And then by using these equation, I had mentioned that by combining these equations, one can actually get an equation something like this here, where if you notice, this is actually even though it looks like a x or it is xi. So, xi here is everything on the left hand side is in the numerator and xi this side here is in the denominator. And these things have been obtained simply by combining the previous equations. So, if you combine these equations, you will get this expression over here and where we can actually see that rho E is given by this expression. And once we solve this equation for x or xi, then we can find out rho E and all the other parameters. So, we actually just shown you this particular example. This example is again given in the Balanus book. So, here x band antenna is to be designed and for that the first step is to choose the proper x band waveguide because the desired frequency at which antenna is to be designed is 11 gigahertz and gain is 22.6 dB. So, corresponding to this frequency we need to find the waveguide and uh, this particular waveguide has been chosen because this actually works in the frequency range from 8.2 to 12.4 and these are the waveguide dimensions that is this actually waveguide is WR90 and as I had mentioned WR90 that 90 really implies 0 0.90 inches. So, A here is 0 0.9 inch and then B is 0 0.4. So, from here we can actually do the design procedure starts like this. So, first for the given value of the gain, we find out the numeric value and then for the given frequency f, we find out what is lambda 
and then b is written in the terms of lambda as well as a is written in terms of lambda. And then this is the initial guess. If we use this particular guess, as we will see, solution is relatively close. But for given value of g0, so the xi value is given by 11.5539. Now, if you substitute this value of xi in this particular equation, you will actually see that left hand side is greater than in the right hand side. So, that means this xi value has to be decreased. So, if this is decreased, this LHS will decrease and this will, will increase. So, after a few iterations, if you do a properly, iterations will be less, but you can see that the xi value is about 11.11. If you compare with this here, it is within 4 percent error, which is fairly good starting point. And if you use this starting point, then we can arrive to the solution quickly. And then once xi is known or we can say x is known, then we can find out all the other parameters like rho e, rho h and then a1, b1 and other dimensions and that completes the design. Now, one thing is you can do all of these equations or there is an alternate way, very fast way and this particular curve is given in the cross book. So, it is actually always a very good idea that you read different books, you read different journals so that you can get the things quickly. So, what this particular book says uh, that this is the plot here which is gain, plot is over here and all the other dimensions are shown in this particular direction here. So, for example, we want to design antenna let us say at 19 dB gain. All you need to do it is you draw the line vertically up. So, corresponding to this you find out what is the value of L lambda which is the distance from here to here which we have also given the nomenclature. This is the known as the neck of the horn antenna. This is the mouth of the horn antenna. So, or you can say this is aperture and this is the joint. So, this distance is given by the term over here and correspondingly a h lambda a e lambda. Uh, just to tell you these a h lambda a e lambda basically are shown in this particular book, but whereas we have taken these as a 1 and b 1. So, just you need to do that correction and then you can see that we can get this particular values and that actually completes the design. And if we look at the result of these things here, now here is a one of the uh, radiation pattern of pyramidal horn. What it shows here that this part here shows the h plane, but this will be symmetrical in this side. Just to save the space only half the portion is shown here. And this is the E plane pattern which is shown over here. Now, let us just see little more carefully. If we look at this E plane pattern, we can see that there is a fairly visible shoulder over here which is at the level of around minus 10 dB. Now, this is happening mainly because of the large phase error. You can also see that the null directions are not very sharp. Whereas, if you recall for array theory when we talked about the space factor concept. So, for uniform field distribution, this should have been generally somewhere here around minus 13 dB or so if the phase error was negligible. So, because of the high phase error, this radiation pattern is not very good. It has a larger side lobe level and you can see that for this entire particular range over here, the value is about minus 10 dB below. 10 dB below means 1 percent power. So, you can see that all this directions power is radiating which is not really the desired power. Now, let us just look at the H plane pattern. For H plane pattern where we had seen that there is a cosine distribution along H plane and for cosine distribution if we apply that array theory, there should have been a somewhere side lobe level would have been close to minus 22 dB or so. But now because of the phase error, one can see that there is no sharp null at all. All you we see here is these are the shoulders which are coming up here. Again, this problem is mainly because of the large phase error. And because of the large phase error only, the efficiency of the horn antenna taken in these design examples is only about 50 percent. 
and some books do take as 60 percent. But however, if we take a better antenna design, then we can get efficiency of 70 to 80 percent also. So, I would like to mention that from here when we read all of these things and I just want to mention when about 10 years back I had started my own company Wilcom Technologies Private Limited which is an IIT Bombay incubated company and we had designed several antennas and we gave these antennas to the telecom operators and other people and then they actually asked have you calibrated these things using standard gain horn antenna. And in fact, we had not done that, but we knew that our things are correct. We even told them that we have done lots of other microstrip antennas. We know how to do the gain calculation. But no, they wanted everything to be calibrated against standard gain horn antenna. And then I went through the internet and saw, so most of these standard gain horn antennas, we saw the prices are approximately 1 lakh or so. And I didn't want to spend so much money. And since I had been teaching horn antenna uh, since 19, you can say 1993, 94. So I felt, well, since I have been teaching, why not I design my own horn antenna? And then when I wanted to manufacture the horn antenna, I realized that a lot of these things which we have discussed now, they talk about the phase error, they talk about aperture dimensions, waveguide dimensions. But they really don't give too much detail about how to feed, what should be the feed dimension, what should be the feed location and other things. So then we real decided that okay, let's do something more carefully and let's see what all we can do. So it was basically that need and that is why they always say, you know, when there is a need, then only you start looking into the thing. So after that we decided, okay, let's just uh, do some simulation and experimental work. So here is a horn antenna. You can actually see that this is where we are feeding the horn antenna. You can actually see the side view from here. One can actually see this dimension B over here and this is where we are feeding it. And if you look from the top, you will actually see only the coaxial feed over here. So now what is important that what should be the height of this particular feed? what should be the diameter of this particular feed and what should be the location of this particular feed with respect to the shorting position. So I'll just tell you quickly, we'll open the suspense right now and then we'll show you what all is happening. So after doing all of these studies, what we really realized that this is really nothing but a monopole antenna, okay? And we know that how to design monopole antenna. And this monopole antenna sees a large ground plane, okay? So we know that for monopole antenna, if you change the length, frequency will change. If we change the diameter, bandwidth will change. And then comes the next part that what should be the location. So since this is a shorting post here, so if this is a short, and if this is lambda g by 4 distance, then this short will act as a open circuit. So there will be no loading on this particular probe at this particular point. However, if this distance varies, there will be some loading on this particular probe and impedance will change. So now after giving you the suspense, now let's see how the values change. So we actually designed antenna at around 900 megahertz. There was a reason because we were designing antennas at CDMA band as well as GSM 900 which covers from 820 megahertz to 960 megahertz. And hence we chose this particular design as our first design. So I'm just giving the basic parameters here, but we'll show you the parametric study of different, different parameters. So just to tell you here, so pro length is, is around 75 mm. And one can actually see that at 900 megahertz, wavelength is 33 centimeter half of that will be slightly more than 80 mm. So we took slightly less than that to account for the diameter effect. Then this is the radius which is 3.5 mm and this is equal to 7 mm diameter. Then we have taken the waveguide dimensions as A is 240 so that we have a cutoff frequency lower than this value here 
and this is the B value and these are the aperture dimensions capital A and capital B we have been writing as small a1 and b1 which is really here capital A and B and this is the horn length which is from you can say from the neck to the mouth which is about 250 mm. So, now let us see one by one what are the effects of the different parameter. So, the first effect is the effect of the probe feed length. So, here what you can see the S11 plot as well as the impedance plot for three values of the probe feed length and these are 70 mm, 75, 80 mm. So, one can actually see that this is the plot for 70, this is the plot for 75, 80. So, as one can see that if we increase the probe length from 70 to 80, which is what I have written here, then what will happen? If we increase the probe length, then the resonance frequency decreases. So, one can see that the resonance frequency decrease from about 895 to 790 megahertz. This is actually straightforward in a sense that if you can even see that approximately L1 F1 is equal to L2 F2. So, if you increase the length frequency will reduce and as far as the Smith chart is plot is concerned. So, basically as we change the dimension what we can see that the impedance plot is basically rotating. What we can see here is that the input impedance curve is rotating clockwise. Now, let us see the effect of the probe radius. Now, as we change the probe radius and you can see here the different three values are there. So, radius is 2 mm, 3.5 mm, 5 mm. So, if we increase the radius, so what do we expect? If we increase the radius in general, you can say that the fringing fields will increase and that will reduce the frequency slightly. So, one can actually see that from here to here to here frequency is reduced slightly. However, the major effect of this is that if we increase the radius, bandwidth increases. One can actually see that if this is S11, which is line here is minus 10 dB. So, you see that this is the bandwidth corresponding to the radius which is 2 mm and if we increase the radius, you can see now that the bandwidth has increased and if we increase the radius further, one can actually see that the bandwidth has increased further and there is a small effect of change in the radius on the impedance plot. Then let us just look at the effect of the probe feed location. So, what we have shown here for three different values of the probe feed location and this is 60, 67.5, 75. Now, these are approximately equal to lambda g by 4 at the desired frequency. Now, one can actually see that by changing the pro feed location, you can see the change in the frequency. Actually speaking, there is no change in the frequency. However, there is a significant change in the impedance plot. What one can see that if this distance is small, if distance is small, now one can just go back look at the figure. If this distance is small, then this impedance looking from here recall transmission line. For transmission line, we know if this length is less than lambda by 4, then this input impedance becomes inductive. And if the length is more than lambda by 4, input impedance here will be capacitive. So, that impedance will do the loading effect. And one can actually now see, so for shorter distance, one can actually see for shorter distance input impedance will be inductive. So, one can actually see the shift along the inductive region. In fact, this particular concept can be used to optimize the feed location, so that we can get a proper impedance matching with the feed probe. And then now let us see the effect of the horn length. So, here aperture dimensions are fixed as before I mentioned, I will just go back here. So, the aperture dimensions are 450 by 320 and what we are showing you is the effect of the this particular horn length change. So, one can actually see for the fixed aperture as we increase the horn length, one can actually see uh, that frequency efficiency has been shown for two different values of the frequency. 
these are basically you can say close to the two band edge frequencies. So, one can actually see that at lower frequency efficiency somewhere here and this is the you can frequency efficiency is poor and as we increase the horn length you can see that the efficiency is increasing. Now, if you use that concept of the optimum pyramidal horn antenna which will actually give us a very uh, poor efficiency that will correspond to somewhere over here corresponding to this horn length. However, if we increase the horn length and one can see that if the horn length is greater than 150 mm which is over here, if you choose this here you can see that this efficiency is greater than 72 percent, so anywhere around there. And then if we actually take the horn length greater than 250 mm which is somewhere over here, then we can see that efficiency is close to 80 percent. Now, here we can actually see there is a no point in keep on increasing the horn length to even 450 or so, you can see that efficiency is relatively constant. So, after certain point there is a no increase in the efficiency that means that the phase error after this is relatively very small, but this much phase error is acceptable for a decent frequency. So, one needs to choose some of these parameters. So, uh, that is why I do not over emphasize that you do all those uh, optimum calculations and do all of those things. So, basically what you do that you try to use the horn antenna with the relatively lower phase error. In fact, I did mention and that earlier that what we had seen that in the books they mentioned for E plane you can actually take maximum phase error as 90 degree and in the H plane you can take phase error up to about 135 degree. I do not recommend this at all. I suggest that for E plane maximum error you should plan to take is about 45 degree phase error. So, choose the length and dimensions accordingly. Similarly, for H plane you can take phase error between 45 degree to 90 degree, but lower the phase error better will be the efficiency. So, yes we read lot of good things in the book, but the thing is when these things were written those days we did not have these sophisticated software tool. So, many of these things were done analytically or they had done some approximations to derive or they had used these analytical expressions to come to the result. However, those days because of the lack of the sophisticated computer simulations and software. So, now we have all these tools. So, utilize these tools. So, do not take everything what is there in the book as the final thing the books actually give us the guiding thing, they give us the theory, you read those theory, understand the concept and then apply your logical and analytical ability to improve upon the performance of the antenna. And also please remember whatever is your application, you need to do optimization according to that particular application. Sometimes you may have a restriction on the length sometimes you may have a restriction on the aperture. So, you need to look at what are the restrictions, where you need to put and then also many a times you have to see that you would like to get a very good reflection coefficient if you are feeding very high power or you need to see that I need a better efficiency. So, it all depends upon what is the actual requirement. So, do not think that, that everything given in the book is the final word you should read the books, understand and I always encourage the people to read the books because like when I wrote a book on broadband microstrip antenna, it took me about 2 years to write that book and also I put my 20 years of experience in writing that book. Similarly, like books written by Cross or Bolanis and other people, these people have put decades of their experiences in writing these books. So, we should read these things and also I strongly recommend that you should read the journal papers also because in the journals you will always see the latest things happening around the world. So, with that let us go to the next part that is let us now look at the effect of the horn aperture on the directivity. 
So, here what we have done? We have kept the length fixed and the aperture dimensions are increasing. You can see that 360, 450, 540. But what we have done? Aspect ratio has been kept constant. So, in this particular case, you can see that when this is the dimension, that is the directivity curve here. If we increase the aperture dimension, we can see that the directivity is increasing. But when we increase the aperture further, you can actually see yes, in the beginning it is increasing, but towards this point here, if you see at this point, the directivity is actually same for these two aperture. And if the directivity is same for these two aperture, then why take a larger size? So, what is the reason why directivity has started? Because the reason for this is that our length was fixed. And if the length is fixed and if we keep on increasing the aperture area, then phase error starts increasing. So, this is now for a simple practice for you people. Take these dimension, the length is given to you which is 250 mm. Calculate what is the phase error for different frequency values and you will know that why directivity is decreasing at this particular level here. So, based on these dimension, then we actually did the fabrication. So, here is the fabricated antenna picture. You can see that this is the coaxial feed over here. This is the another view from taken from the front. You can see that that is the probe length over here. These are the aperture dimension. So, we have done the simulation using I3D also. We have done simulation using CST microwave studio software also and then we have done the measurement also. So, you can see that the results are in reasonably good agreement and the bandwidth for this minus 10 dB is almost close to about 50 percent. And let us just also look at the radiation pattern. You can see the radiation pattern in E plane as well as H plane and here are the frequency values 700, 850. You can see frequency is increasing and this is the gain plot. You can see the gain is slightly increasing. Okay. So, that is the reason because aperture is fixed, frequency is increasing and we know that the directivity is given by 4 pi a by lambda square. So, if the frequency is increasing, lambda will reduce, hence gain will increase. Now, here you can still see that the side lobe levels are fairly low because the antenna which we have designed that has a relatively very good efficiency greater than 70 percent. So, phase error is less, hence our patterns are also relatively good. So, we will conclude the to today's lecture here. So, what we saw today, a pyramidal horn antenna, we looked into the typical design equations given and how we can do the design. However, as I said, those optimum design which are given in the books, they assume efficiency of 50 percent or maximum 60 percent. So, hence those are not really the optimum dimension because they have given the design for larger phase error. Whereas, then after that, we gave you the parametric study of what should be the location of the feed point, what should be the diameter, what should be the length and we have given these dimension for a given frequency and you can do the frequency scaling. In fact, after using this 900 megahertz, we also designed another horn antenna at 1800 megahertz and the results were very similar as we had shown you for this particular case here. So, we strongly recommend that do not take phase error more than 45 degree for E plane and for H plane some relaxation is there 45 degree to up to absolute maximum is 90 degree. And then we also showed you what are the experimental results which were in good agreement with the simulated result. So, in the next lecture we will look into horn antennas and many other things. So, with that bye, we will see you next time.